You know that moment where you sit down to edit and all of a sudden you realize your videos have no audio? And now you're just sitting here wondering, should I just redo the whole thing and just do a voiceover? Or should I just yell, scream, throw some stuff and forget all about it? As much as I want to do the second option, here we go again. <laughs> I know it's been a long, hot minute since I've posted anything. Honestly, life has just gotten away from me. Between work, and school, relationship issues, trying to develop my artsy side a little bit more, I've just had a hard time motivating myself to research topics and then actually sit down in front of a camera and record. Or, you know, in this case, record it, find out everything was broken, get upset, and then re-record it. <laughs> I can't tell you how many half-research topics I have on my computer right now. But all that aside, here I am, backing in with another topic for you. I'm getting over a really bad cold, so please excuse the sickly voice. Okay, let's do this. Unless you've been hiding under a rock for the last hundred years, you've at least heard of the Russian royal family and their untimely demise. Even if you haven't heard of the family, there's definitely one name you have heard of. The Princess Anastasia! Rather than put the entire family's history in one video, here's what we're going to do. We're going to start with Nicholas, who is the father, then we're going to move on to his wife, then we'll move on to the daughters, each individually, and then finally their son. And once we've dissected everyone's history up until the Russian Revolution and the overthrow of the monarchy, we'll put the family back together and finish out their story at the same time. Make sure you hit that subscribe button down below so you can be notified every time I upload a new video. And also as a side note, there's going to be a lot of Russian words in these videos, and I don't speak Russian, so I'm sorry if I mispronounce anything. Nicholas Alexandrovich Romanov was born on May 6th of 1868 near St. Petersburg to Sarevich Alexander Alexandrovich Romanov and Marie-Sophie Frederick Dagmar, or the Dagmar of Denmark. He was their firstborn of six children, putting him second in line for the position of Tsar behind his father, as stated by the Pauline Laws implemented by Tsar Paul I. Priority in the order of succession to the Russian throne belonged to male members of the Romanov dynasty, however distantly related to the Tsar, so long as any remained alive. Basically what that says is it goes from male to male to male, and it starts with whoever is the most closely related to whoever is current Tsar, so you know, the Tsar would go to a son, but if he doesn't have a son, it would go to his brother, and then so on and so on. His childhood was one with a nurturing family environment, and his father had a strong influence on Nicholas's idea of conservatism, religious values, and belief in autocracy. It was thought by the Romanov family that they had the God-given right to rule over Russia, and no one could take that power away from them. Nicholas was educated through private tutors, even through high-ranking Russian officials. He was taught languages, history, science, horsemanship, shooting, and dancing. He excelled most in history and foreign languages. Unfortunately for him, he was not tutored on how to succeed in being a monarch. His father always assumed that he would be ruling for many decades, and he had plenty of time to teach his son how to rule. Nicholas also didn't have the temperament nor the proper upbringing to become a successful Tsar. While he did have a great personal charm, he was naturally timid and he preferred to stay away from the public's eye. In 1881, when he was 13 years old, his grandfather, Tsar Alexander II, was assassinated by a revolutionary bomber. Nicholas watched in horror as his maimed grandfather was brought back to the palace and died. With his passing, Nicholas's father became Tsar Alexander III of Russia. Nicholas took the title of Tsarevich. Nicholas went to his uncle Sergei's wedding in 1884 in St. Petersburg when he was 16. His uncle was marrying Princess Elizabeth of Hesse and by Rhine. While there, he noticed Elizabeth's 12-year-old sister. They met on various occasions in the years following, falling madly in love with each other. Nicholas's journals even document his desires to one day marry her. At age 19, Nicholas decides to join the army. He joined an exclusive regiment as well as the horse artillery unit. Though a Sarjevic, he didn't participate in serious military activities. He enjoyed his time in the military and rose through the ranks, eventually becoming colonel. Nicholas lived a carefree lifestyle in which he took advantage of his freedom by attending parties and balls. There were very few responsibilities weighing him down. In 1890, the Tsar and Tsarina encouraged Nicholas to take his brother with him on a royal grand tour around the world. They left Russia, traveling by steamship and train, visiting the Middle East, India, China, and Japan. 
They were in Japan in 1891 when there was an assassination attempt on Nicholas's life. A man lunged at the Sarevic and swung a sword at his head. While his motive was never determined, Nicholas only suffered minor wounds. His father demanded that the brothers return home immediately. By his mid-twenties, Nicholas was expected to find a wife. He had been dating a Russian ballerina whom he left to pursue a more suitable option. He then began to date Alexandra of Hesse and proposed to her in April of 1894, the same girl he met at his uncle's wedding. She did not agree right away, but a day later said yes. The Romanov family was very unhappy with the relationship. They did not like that there would be a German woman in line to be a Tsarina. Despite their protests, Nicholas and Alexandra were genuinely in love, and that was very rare for royal betrothals. They planned to marry the next year. However, disaster would strike and throw a wrench in their plans. Tsar Alexander III fell ill with a disease that caused the kidneys to become inflamed. On October 20th of 1894, the Tsar died, leaving his 26-year-old son to inherit the throne. Nicholas was not ready to become Tsar. He struggled to keep up with the duties expected of him, including planning his father's funeral. He received much criticism for all sides as the funeral took place. He did not feel like he could fill the large shoes left by his father. He was poorly trained in the states of affair, and he was in mourning. He even told a friend, I'm not prepared to be Tsar. I never wanted to become one, and I know nothing of the business in ruling. Nicholas and Alexander decided to wed now rather than wait. On November 26 of 1894, they officially became man and wife. Since it was considered inappropriate to have a reception during a period of mourning, the newlywed couple returned to the palace swiftly after the ceremony. They moved to the Alexander Palace outside St. Petersburg, and they soon were expecting their firstborn. On November 3, 1895, Grand Duchess Olga Romanov was born. Nicholas's coronation was held on May 26, 1896 at the Kremlin. A year and a half after his father's death, he became Tsar Nicholas II. The coronation went off without accident, and they declared that there would be nationwide three-day celebration. There's a celebration held the day after his coronation near Moscow for the common people. Nearly 100,000 were in attendance. Gifts were to be handed out for those in attendance. They were expected to receive a painted aluminum cup with the monogram of the new Tsar and Tsarina, a half pound of sausage, a rolled fruit cake, a stamped cake, and a bag of sweets and nuts. There are also 20 mobile pubs serving free beer and wine. And you have to remember at this point, everyone in Russia was starving. There just wasn't enough food for everyone or they were too poor to afford food. So for them to receive sausage and cakes and sweets, it was a very big deal. Rumors started circulating early in the morning that there weren't going to be enough gifts to go around and that the stewards were hoarding the gifts for themselves. Mass insanity broke out and eyewitness accounts what happened. The mob jumped up as a single man and threw itself forward with incredible speed as though it were running away from fire. The rear rows pushed at the front. People fell and were trampled. Everyone lost the ability to feel that they were walking on living bodies as stones or logs. It lasted only 10 to 15 minutes. By the time the mob woke up, it was too late. 1,389 people were killed in the stampede and another 1,300 were injured. While Nicholas wanted to mourn for his fallen people, he and the Tsarina had an engagement to attend a ball with the French ambassador. According to 19th century governing behavior, the ambassador was of equal importance as the ruler of France. It would have been rude to refuse, and in the state of the current affairs, it also could have been dangerous and meant war. This gave the people of Russia a bad impression of the new Tsar and Tsarina, accusing them of being heartless. The event forever gave Nicholas the name Nicholas the Bloody. The following events were canceled to show remorse for those who had fallen. Nicholas and Alexandra visited the hospitals where the wounded lay, and he personally gave each victim's family a thousand rubles. At the time, the average yearly salary was only around 328 rubles. Two years later, in 1897, Alexandra gave birth to their second daughter, the Grand Duchess Tatiana. Another two years passed before their third daughter, Grand Duchess Maria, was born. While they were extremely excited for her birth, the Romanov family was disappointed that she was not a son. In 1901, Alexandra gave birth once again to a daughter, Grand Duchess Anastasia. The family was growing impatient that there still had not been a son born yet to become heir. Finally, 
on July 30th, 1904, their only son, Saravik Alexei, was born. Celebration broke out across the country. Although, much to his mother's dismay, he was born with hemophilia. What hemophilia is, if you don't know, is the blood isn't able to clot. So let's say that Alexei had fallen down and cut his arm. Normal people, when that happens, they bleed, but then their blood clots, and that's how you know you stop bleeding. With people who have hemophilia, they aren't able to clot and stop bleeding, so they will continue to bleed. So especially in this time, any small wound could be fatal. While they kept it secret from the world, Alexei's condition brought the close family even closer. The family often kept to themselves at the palace and only ventured out for formal events. Early in his rule, Nicholas's main goal was to maintain the status quo Russia had with Europe, not conquer new territory. Nicholas had kept many of his father's advisors on, including Sergei Witt, the Minister of Finance. Under his influence, industry grew rapidly in Russia, and he encouraged the construction of the Trans-Siberian Railroad in 1891. The railroad would connect Russia to the Pacific coast. Though, the resurgence of Russia in the region created a worried Japan. In 1904, Japan attacked Russia. Nicholas thought that the attack was no more than the bite of a flea. He was extremely confident in Russia's ability to win. By December of 1904, Russia had suffered a humiliating defeat and had to surrender Port Arthur. By the spring, his fleet was decimated, and by summer, he had entered peace negotiations. Though, by this point in his rule, he had much more important matters to worry about. On January 9, 1905, there was a large peaceful protest in St. Petersburg calling for better working conditions, political change, and representation. Despite the peaceful atmosphere, troops opened fire on the crowd, killing more than a thousand civilians. Following Bloody Sunday, the workers throughout the country went on strike and peasants voiced their discontent. There were more than 3,000 instances of peasant unrest that required troop involvement. Nicholas was confused as to what was going on. It was his God-given right to rule over Russia and pass his patrimony down to his heir. He didn't want to give up any power, and he tried to enforce this by putting the revolts down by force. When his uncle, the Grand Duke Sergei Alexandrovich, was assassinated in February, Nicholas realized the gravity of the situation. In 1906, Peter Stolypin was elected to be the Prime Minister. He wanted to make many social reforms, but Nicholas didn't want to hear it. Under pressure, Nicholas created an elected legislator called the Duma, although before their first session, he tried to limit the power that it had to be able to keep as much power for himself as he could. He continued to resist reform and act as an autocrat. This idea was reinforced by the government's ability to put rebellions down across the country by force. The 300-year celebration of the Romanov dynasty took place in 1913. Nicholas desperately wanted to reclaim the power that had been held by his ancestors. He posed for a photo with his family in outfits that would have been worn by the Romanovs in the 17th century. World War I broke out in 1914. The Russians renamed St. Petersburg as Petrograd in an attempt to make it sound less German. Unfortunately for the Tsar, the war exposed his weaknesses. The Russians performed horribly at the beginning of the war, causing Nicholas to bring his sense of duty to the forefront. He decided to take charge of the army as commander-in-chief. His advisors warned against this as he would be blamed personally for any further military failures. Nicholas didn't want to hear it and convinced them that he would lead. By April of 1915, Nicholas spent most of his time away from Petrograd to lead the army. This left Alexander in charge back home, which also allowed Gregory Rasputin to gain more influence. Through policy set forth by Alexander and Rasputin, popular opinion turned against the Tsar. Riots broke out across Petrograd by February of 1917. No part of society was supportive of the royal family. Nicholas had been at headquarters 400 miles from the capital, but was unable to return to his family by train. His military commanders and other politicians urged Nicholas to allow a parliamentary rule. Nicholas did not want to hear any of it, stating, I am responsible before God and Russia for everything that has happened and is happening. Nicholas's unwillingness to compromise cost him his throne. By the time he was willing to compromise, the situation had deteriorated to the point where it was no longer acceptable. The only option the people would hear was for him to abdicate the throne. On March 2, 1917, in an attempt to spare his and his family's lives, 
Nicholas abdicated the Russian throne for both himself and his son Alexei. Having been stripped of his title of Tsar, Nicholas was able to keep his military title of Colonel. Some people think that Nicholas was a kind and decent man. Others find him to be a tyrannical leader who forced the Russian people to revolt. What's your opinion of him? Let me know down below.